you will, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. When I first saw this passage and began kind of working through this, a couple of things came to mind. One is it brought back to me some memory of, of churches that I'd been in before and, and uh, served and been taught the word and then moved away and, and felt a longing to be back there. Um, felt that, you know, I've kind of missed um, the folks there and the relationships. You may have been through that before also. Or it may be that you've moved away from family and you just kind of long to be back with them. Or a group of people, maybe that you've worked with. We're going to look at a couple of things of, of, of Paul and his heart and his longing for these, for these folks. And one other possible application here could be just an idea of what can we pray through when we're praying for another church or we're praying for another group of people. A few years back, we were ministering downtown, serving food and and bringing some folks here to, to worship. And we were praying with some of the folks that were homeless. And a young man asked me, he said, exactly what do I pray for them for? I, I don't know them. I don't know if they're following Christ. I don't know if he's working in their life. But I'm not sure exactly what I would pray for them for. So there possibly could be some, some even some application there. But we're certainly going to see Paul and his heart for these folks. And I think this is the same heart that should reside in us here among ourselves in this community of of believers. So if you will stand and we're going to um, take a look at four or five different um, items from this, uh, topics from this passage and hopefully we'll get through these first two um, this week and then we'll take a look at the remaining three next week. But Ephesians chapter 3 beginning in verse 14. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glorious, of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do more, far more abundantly than we could ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Continuing to practice what Brother Bill has taught us, we have just read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Thank you. You may be seated. So I'd like to look at this this passage kind of under, under five different headings. One is that the Holy Spirit would empower us. This is one of the first things that Paul prayed, that Christ would dwell in us that Christ's love would master us, that God would fill us, and that God would glorify himself. Paul prays for the believers that they would be strengthened uh, with power through the Spirit. And one uh, commentator I looked at said that this is kind of broken down, it kind of manifests itself, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you may know the love of of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness of God, and that God's glory would be manifest and proclaimed. That kind of is the end goal of everything that we should be doing, the end goal of all things that happen. 
that God's glory be manifest. So looking at this, at this passage of verses 14 through 16, the Holy Spirit empowers us. He strengthens our inner man. And we see here in these verses, Paul says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Paul basically gives the, the basic truths of Christian life right here. Specifically, who we are in Christ and the great unlimited resources that we have available in Christ. From verses 314 through the rest of, the, of this letter, we're exhorted to claim and to live by these truths. Paul makes his prayer request on behalf of these Ephesians, Ephesian believers. In sharing his request with them, he urges them to live in the full power and effectiveness that he calls it every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. The first prayer is for them to know their power, and we see that at the beginning of the book. And then this second prayer is for them to use this power that's been made available to them. The prayer of Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 through 21 is a plea to God that also serves as a plea for us believers. Paul pleads with believers to respond to God, to his sovereign provision, and he pleads with God to motivate them to do that. Because God not only is the provider, but he is also the one who initiates this in our lives. And he's the one who motivates or strengthens us or causes us to desire this. Paul began this prayer by repeating the words that he began in chapter 2, where he says, For this reason... In verse 5, he says, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, God made us alive together in Christ. This is one of those reasons. Paul cites for us in in, in verse uh, 10 of chapter 2, he states, for we are his workmanship. In verse 19, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow Christians or fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In verse 20, he tells us that you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. These are the the reasons that he's talking about in verse 14 where he says, for this reason. He's he's listed these out in chapter 2. These are the reasons that he's stating we need to begin looking at this prayer for this reason. And then he says, every family in heaven and on earth. This refers to the saints of every age. Those now in heaven and those still remaining on the earth. Us. They are the only ones who immediately derive their names from God the Father. Christians are no more or less the children of God than were believing Israelites as well as believing Gentiles. For the coming of Christ, every family of believers is a part of one spiritual family of God in which there are many members, but only one father and one brotherhood. We are one in Christ. We have one family name in the spiritual sense of that word. For God to give according to the riches of his glory is absolutely staggering. Because of his riches, are un, his riches are limitless, completely without bounds. Yet this is exactly the measure by which Paul implores God to empower this church. These are the riches that God has manifest here. Not because of us, but because of him. Because of his riches made available to us. Almost every prayer of Paul's 
that is recorded in Scripture is for the spiritual welfare of others. It just got me thinking about that. What does my prayer life look like? Thanksgiving, certainly. Intercession, interceding for others, yes. My own self, absolutely. Paul lays out an example here that's almost beyond the thinking of the American way. Almost really in contrast to the American way. I mean, not only what he did, there, there was a few times where his prayer was for him. But it was so that the gospel would be made manifest in him. And by far the vast majority was for the spiritual welfare of others. It just begs the question, how much of my prayer time is engaged in the spiritual welfare of you? And as you're in prayer, how much of that time is for the spiritual welfare of others here. For Brother Bill, for your deacons, for your Sunday school teacher, for those that you're sitting beside now, for those that are caring for, for our children. It almost kind of, to my mind, it, it just kind of, almost a, a barometer of how much do I really love others more than I love myself? This seems to be like it may be an indicator of that. Even when Paul was persecuted, imprisoned, and in need of many things for his own welfare, he pr prayed primarily for fellow believers that they might be spiritually protected and strengthened. When you're being beaten, left for dead, shipwrecked. All of the things, I mean, you just think of all of the things that Paul went through. If I was in any one of those situations, I think I would have a pretty long prayer list about me. And I think I would be pretty earnest in those requests. Paul loved these people so much that he prayed for them continually. Later in this letter in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 19 the apostle asked to pray also for me that the words may be, that be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. If you're going to pray for me, don't pray about my situation. This is temporary. Don't pray for my hunger. Don't pray for my thirst. Don't pray for me that I don't, I don't have anything to write on. I don't have anything to communicate to the other churches with. Don't pray for me that I'm cold. There were a lot of things that he could request a prayer for. All of God's people are to be like Paul in having an overriding sensitivity to the spiritual needs of others. For the salvation of the unsaved, for the spiritual protection and growth of the saved, we are to be sensitive to the spiritual needs of our wives, husbands, children, pastor, other church members, neighbors, students, friends, co-workers. We are to pray for everyone with whom we have any contact. To the follower of Christ, the riches of his glory are rich indeed. From the beginning of the letter, Paul has been exalting over these divine riches. I just 
look through this list. God's blessing us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Choosing us for himself before the foundation of the world. Redemption and forgiveness. His making known to us the mystery of his will. His giving us an inheritance with his son Jesus Christ. This is, this is just some of <laughs> this long list. And throughout the first two and a half chapters, the phrase of his glory testifies that these riches belong to God because of who he is. They belong innately to his person, which is to say his glory, where Paul calls God the father of glory. Those and many others are the riches that every one of us has in Christ. Paul is not praying for God to give these riches to the believers, but that he would grant believers the strength by God according to these riches they have already possessed. <laughs> Interesting when you think about that. These are the riches that have already been given us. And Paul's prayer pr primarily here is that these believers, specifically in, in, in Ephesus and, and to the greater church, that we would use these. How tragic to go around in the tattered rags of our own inadequacy when we could be living sumptuous in the superabundant of God's unspeakable riches. I, I don't spend a whole lot of time praying that for myself. What is there that could be tapped into that could help me live the life I've been called to live? It, it, it really is staggering. The first step in living like God's children is to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Now, most Christians never seem to get to this first step not knowing what it is to see God's power fully at work in them. They suffer, the church suffers, the world suffers. The inner man of most believers is never strengthened with power through God's spirit. Although the outer physical man becomes weaker and weaker with age, the inner spiritual man should continue continually grow stronger and stronger with power. Had an opportunity to, to, to move uh, family yesterday. The outer man is feeling that this morning for me. Mm. I woke up with a few aches and pains that I didn't have. And as we see our physical bodies becoming older and decaying, it should be the exact opposite with our, our inner man, the inner spirit. It should be strengthened so much that we're leading in those things. When I was young and stronger than I am now, I didn't have any problem doing that. If you need something picked up and moved, I could pick it up and move it. And I, I can do some of that now, but I, I pay for it the next day. That shouldn't be the way it is with our, our spiritual lives. Those of us that are older, that have been in the faith longer, need to be leading these efforts, need to be strengthened. We need to find ourselves relying more and more on this strength, this unimaginable power that God has given us leading out in those things. Spending time with younger believers, explaining what that looks like and what that journey has been like. Only God's Spirit can strengthen our spirits. He is the one who energizes, revitalizes, and empowers us. 
In Romans chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, we hear Paul expressing the strong desire of a regenerated man to do the will of God, but being hampered by the sin that dwells in his fleshly body. He says in, in Romans chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my members, I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Paul's saying here that this, this fight that I'm seeing in my inner man, as I grow older and older, I need to be winning that battle more and more. I can't do that on my own. Paul says this here, this is a war that's waging. Month after month, year after year, are you winning that battle more and more? Several months back, Brother Bill introduced life transformation groups to us. And Clifton and I had been meeting for a while and he was deployed and, or in, in boot camp and then also now in training and that had just kind of stopped for a little while. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I got with someone else here and we began that group again. Man, I found a difference in my life this week. Just committing to read the word more, committing to be accountable to someone, it literally changed the way that I lived this past week. These are just some of the tools that, that we've been introduced to over the last 10 or 12 years. Are you using any of these tools that you have available to help win the war? Now, remember, with, this is not a war of flesh and blood, so we can't pull out weapons of warfare that we would normally think of in hand-to-hand -hand combat. <laughs> Over the last 12 years, we've been introduced to numerous different ways for us to help win this battle, for us to help be better disciples, for us, for us to help us to, to be better disciple makers. In chapter 8, we hear Paul express the truth that victory in this conflict is in the Holy Spirit. He says, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for the mind set on flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. This is just one of those things. We move toward those things we think about. If I'm thinking more about being engaged in God's word and reading his word, I'm, I'm thinking more about praying, I'm thinking more about loving my neighbor, I'm going to just naturally gravitate more toward those things. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, he goes on to say. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. In fact, the promise comes that through the power of the Spirit, the believer can kill the evil deeds of his unredeemed flesh. To the Galatians, he wrote in chapter 5 and verse 16, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. What are you saturating your mind with? The news? Nothing wrong with watching the news. Is that really helping me? <laughs> Is it helping me win this battle? It can be something that I do, but it may not necessarily be my focus. Just deciding that this week, I'm going to read the book of Ephesians. That's time where my mind is not entertaining other things that won't help me get where Christ wants me to be. Right? 
It's helping me focus on these things, not to fulfill the desires of the flesh. The obedient, effective, and productive Christian must be spirit conscious, spirit filled, and spirit controlled. Why? Because that doesn't, that doesn't reside in my flesh. It, it, it has to be from the Spirit. One of the things that we've been challenged with since the beginning of, of this year is, is to spend time alone with God where we just try to remove the distractions and just sit and say, Father, speak to me. I want to hear from you. And if you have anything to say to me, I want you to find me with a listening ear. I want you to find me paying attention. Where you don't have to holler at me or run me down, as it were. But I'm focused. Spiritual growth can be defined as the decreasing frequency of sin. Something we all have to work on. The more we exercise our spiritual muscles, if you will, yielding to the Spirit's control of our lives, the less sin is present. Where the strength of God increases, sin inevitably decreases. So I've got to measure myself against those things. What am I deliberately engaging in this coming week to help me in that battle? It's not just going to come natural. The nearer we come to God, the further we go from sin. The outward man does indeed suffer wear and tear. But every day the inward man receives fresh strength. Let's take a look at this second point, Christ dwelling in us. So that's the, the Holy Spirit being there to empower us, to strengthen the inner man. And next, Christ dwells in us. In verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. So that gives us the, the purpose of our being strengthened with power is that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. Paul restates, restates the prayer central appeal by identifying the presence of Christ with the empowerment of the Spirit. Just as the church is becoming a holy temple for God, so the individual believers receives the presence of Christ. The words that here use may dwell carries a sense of residing permanently. Have you ever had relatives or someone move into your home just for a day or two? And it ends up being a little more than a day or two. <laughs> your desire at that point is that they not reside permanently with you. <laughs> right? I love you but you are going to have to move out. <laughs> that's, the, that's the idea of this, that it may dwell. It's, it's permanently residing. And, and in your hearts, the ancient Greek and, and Jewish culture represented essential aspects of, of existence and identity in the heart. The inner being, the will, the intelligence. One commentator described it this way, Christ exercising a constant power within us, both in the active and passive movements of our inner being, of our heart. Active and passive. And here's what happens. Christ exercising a constant power within us, giving us the sense of pardon and acceptance. Boy, I need to hear that. I need to hear that every day. <laughs> Molding the will, that's an exercise. Molding my, me just being in a constant 
uh, state and thought of submitting myself to the will of God. Sweetening the emotions. (laughs) Your spouse will notice this. Enlightening and confirming the conscience. Purifying principles of actions, the things that I'm doing. This, to be secured by their faith, receiving Christ in all his fullness, resting and living in him believing his promises, and longing for this second coming. This is the Holy Spirit strengthening the inner man. Christ cannot fully be at home until he is allowed to dwell permanently in our hearts through the continuing faith and trust in him, to exercise his lordship over every aspect of our lives. We practice as well as receive his presence by faith. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Paul uses three pictures here to convey this idea of of spiritual depth. Three pictures that are hidden in the verbs dwell, rooted, and grounded that we looked at earlier. We've already seen the verb dwell literally means to settle down and to feel at home. That's that permanent residence. Certainly Christ was already resident in the hearts of these believers at Ephesus. Paul addressed them as saints in chapter 1, verse 1. What Paul is praying for here is a deeper existence between Christ and his people. He yearns for Christ to, to settle down and to feel at home in their hearts. Not a surface relationship, but an ever deepening fellowship. The verb rooted has its idea of security, settles in and moves in to this idea of kind of the plant world. The tree must get its roots deeply from the soil if it's to have both nourishment and stability. There's been a couple of trees in our neighborhood that have been blown over by some winds recently. When you look at their root structure, it's not... It's not very much at all. I mean, the wind blew them over. As we continue to learn of Christ and as we continue to allow him to dwell in us and we get our power from him, that root structure grows. It it allows us to go through all kinds of different things in life and still remain focused on the glory of God. We see this in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And all he does, he prospers. Kind of a good commentary on that passage is found in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 8. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness and an uninhabited salt land. Conversely, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who trusts is in the Lord. Next slide. 
He is like a tree planted by waters that sends out its roots by the streams and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. It is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. What a great explanation of Psalm chapter 1. Sending out roots by the stream, not fearing when heat comes, when pressure comes, when life begins to press on us when difficulties happen. No fear. Leaves remaining green. How are you doing? Oh, I'm getting by. doesn't exactly sound like this. Not ceasing to bear fruit. One of the most important questions a Christian can ask himself, from what do I draw my nourishment and my stability? Is it my family? Is it my friends? My spouse? My children? Those can't ultimately help you win the battle that wages war within ourselves. The roots must go deeper and deeper into the love of Christ. Grounded here is an architectural term. It refers to the foundations on which we build, refers to us going deeply or being deeply founded. We had a neighbor just down the street that bought a house, got ready to, to build on a second story to that house. He found out a couple of things weren't quite right. Number one, the rock that was around that house wasn't attached to the house at all. It was just a freestanding rock wall. Any number of things could knock that over. He also found that the slab that was poured wasn't square. So for him to begin building off of that, the house would not be square. And the foundation and the footing wasn't deep enough. So he had to completely start all over to build on this second floor. That's the idea of this being rooted and founded or grounded. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and earth. Under all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. The trials of life test the depth of our experience with Christ. The, the trials of life test the firmness and steadfastness we have in Christ. Paul's prayer here for this church, I think our prayer for ourselves begins with the Holy Spirit empowering us and us tapping in to that vastness of riches that lie there and that Christ would dwell in us. Next week we'll pick up with the rest of this passage. Will you commit to praying those two things this next week? for each other, for me, for your deacons, for Brother Bill. The Holy Spirit would empower us and Christ would dwell in us. Read through this passage this week. We'll come back and take a look at Christ's love, that it would master us, that God would fill us, and that God would glorify himself. Let's pray.
Father, what a treasure to be able to look into your word. Father, we've just been reminded again that this life that you've called us to cannot be obtained by our own flesh. It can't be obtained by our own will. It can't be obtained by our own intellect. It has to be based of our relationship with you and the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you would give us aid, give us strength to pray that for ourselves and for one another. Strengthen us in this body, in Jesus' name.